last week after the service, uh, as we were getting into the car to go home, my son uh, asked me what I was going to preach this Sunday, because he knew that a new series was going to be starting. Uh, so I told him that we we're going to preach through the book of Jonah over the next four weeks in a series entitled Heart of a Missionary. And he, he said, uh, that will be a great follow-up to what you preached this morning. And I thought, excellent. <laughs> Even the children can see the pattern. It's exactly how I planned it. We are going to, uh, we are going to follow up by continuing to talk about missions. Uh, uh, as I thought about where I want to take us as a church over the next few weeks, leading up to Resurrection Sunday, I decided it would make a lot of sense for us to examine our hearts. But not just to examine our hearts in general, but to examine our hearts on something very specific. Uh, there's something that I say a lot. There's a phrase that you will hear me use, and you'll probably hear me use it in multiple sermons. It's just something I like to say a lot, and that is this. We are the missionaries to hear. We are the missionaries to hear. You know how when we describe missionaries, when we describe people go out, we often say stuff like, um, well, they are missionaries to Ukraine. They are missionaries to China. Well, I discovered something when I was a missions pastor for about five years, meeting with missionaries and partner churches and pastors all over the world. The missionaries in all of those locations were just the Christians there doing the work of sharing the gospel and making disciples. That's who those, those magical missionaries are in those far-off locales. It's just the people that are there who are making disciples. Some of them were from other countries. Most of them actually were from that particular location. All of them were operating as a local church unified in the same work, which got me thinking, if the missionaries to Zimbabwe are almost entirely Zimbabwean because it's just the local church doing its work, then who are the missionaries to my community? It's us. <laughs> you ever thought about this? It's us. We're the missionaries sent by God to hear. The people of Rochester are our first and primary mission field, and we are the missions team sent by God to this community. Did you know that? Did you know you're a missionary? You're a missionary to Rochester. Jesus commanded his disciples to go and to teach new disciples to do all that he had commanded them to do, including making new disciples. You see how circular that is? You see how that works? We, church, are a missions organization. We are a team of heavily trained disciple makers sent by God to bring his gospel to the people of our community. And I say heavy, heavily trained because many of you, lots of you, I might even go as far as to say the majority of you have spent much of your life studying the Bible, hearing sermons, uh, sharing the gospel, uh, getting, getting involved in, in various missions or in various ministries where you are you know, soaking your mind in Scripture. And by the way, that's an outstanding thing that you, you have all of this knowledge about God. We should keep growing in our knowledge of the Scriptures so that we can continue to apply them to our lives. But there is a problem if we stop with personal growth. There's a huge problem if we stop with personal growth. Mainly, the biggest problem is we weren't called to a mission of personal growth. Jesus never said, my mission for you is that you personally grow. He sent us on a mission to make disciples. Jesus put us out there to seek and to save the lost, to not only grow in Christ, but to give away the gospel and help other people grow in Christ. As they sharpen us, we sharpen them. We go to the community, and together we build up the body of Christ. And so why is it that so many Christians today do not see themselves on this mission, serving as the Lord's missionaries? Why is it that somehow uh, a Christianity has been separated from that mission? Well, as I read Scripture, I think the diagnosis of Scripture is a lukewarm heart. 
I think it's a lukewarm heart. I think it's a desire for comfort. I think it's a pride of status that says, as long as I'm saved, and as long as the people that I love directly around me are saved, then I don't really care and have to worry about anybody else. Church, what I want to do is recapture a heart's passion in each of us to fulfill the biblical mandate from the Lord to be his missionaries to hear and to whatever, wherever he will send our people around the world, whether they are from this generation of Calvary or from the next generation of Calvary, that we would be faithful to go and be God's missionaries wherever it is, because wherever we are, that is where he has sent us. I, I, I want for us to have such a deep love for Christ, such a passion for the glory of God, that his mission will shape every choice that we make. I, I want to see the church recapture the boldness of sharing the gospel. You know in Acts, they, if you read it in Acts chapter 4, they prayed for boldness. I want to get to a place where we pray for boldness in sharing the gospel when it can cost us something. I want to see the church focus in on an unreached people group around the world, or multiple ones, but we you always start with one, right? I would love for our church to get to the place where we focus in on an unreached people group somewhere in the world as the Lord would lead us and guide us to unite our hearts to that people and that we would become integral in reaching them for Christ, planting churches and raising up missionaries. I want to see small groups of Calvary people throughout our city thinking strategically and creatively about how to reach the people that, that they love and who are in the community right around them so that we can share the gospel with them. But to do all that, to accomplish any of that, it has to start in our hearts. It has to start in our hearts. No amount of strategic thinking and planning is going to bring about the fulfillment of the mission until our hearts are first aligned with the mission of Jesus. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, that we only have to clean the inside of the dish, and then the outside of the dish will also be clean. You remember that passage? I've been saving time on dishes for years with that passage. <laughs> right? What he's saying is, what he's saying is, you, you can try to make yourself look godly. You can try to make yourself look godly on the outside, but it doesn't matter if you're full of greed and self-indulgence on the inside. It's the inside that matters. And it's the same with Jesus' mission. Real transformation starts in our mind and in our heart when we repent of sin and, and, and from running from the Lord and not caring about his mission. And when we repent of that and we embrace Jesus' uh, mission and, his, the, and we have a passion for Christ and a compassion for people, and when we get that, we say, all right, Lord, here I am. Send me. I'm ready. I can't keep this passion inside. Send me. To explore that heart, to explore the heart of the missionary, we're going to go to a book that teaches us obedience by sharing and showing us an extreme level of disobedience. This is irony in what we're going to do. We're going to learn obedience by looking at disobedience. We're going to read the cautionary tale of a man who so set against fulfilling the Lord's mission to save sinners that he literally goes in the opposite direction. Not just in his heart, on a boat. He physically goes in the wrong direction. And in the same story, you're going to see that literally every other character... Every other character throughout this book that we are going to read is going to do exactly what the Lord calls it to do. Whether it's people, inanimate objects, everything listens to God's voice, responds to God's leading, and worships God with passion and conviction. You ever see one of those uh, shows on TV sometimes where uh, they take a bunch of troubled teenagers down to the prison and, and they bring them in there and some guy named Left Eye screams in their face until they cry? So they'll stop selling drugs, right? Have you ever seen that show? Yeah. That's what the book of Jonah is. Jonah is going to scream in our face until we understand and scare us straight 
so that we will never again become so proud and self-focused that we lose sight of Christ's mission. Today we're going to look at the black heart of a faithless missionary so that we'll know that we can't run from the calling of the Lord to carry out his mission. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and you can open them to Jonah chapter 1. I will have it on the screen today too. You can open there if you'd like to. I'm going to look at Jonah, this short book that I'm going to assume, this has been just my assumption, I've noticed this through the years, people think they understand this book better than they do. <laughs> I think it's because of all the flannel graph, right? People, people think like they have a really good understanding of this. But you're going to be surprised, I think. We know from 2 Kings 14.25 that Jonah was a prophet of the northern kingdom who prophesied during the time of Jeroboam II, so roughly 793 to 753 B.C. We don't have a lot of information about his ministry career. He didn't write a book, and his sayings were not compiled into a book, and that's probably because of the one book we do have that tells us the kind of prophet that he was. So why record that? We're going to look at the first 16 verses of chapter 1 today, breaking it into four parts, but you need to understand there really is only one point of the entire first chapter here, and that's the unveiling of the heart of a man who has fallen into unfaithfulness. Pick it up with me at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amatai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. For their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. There are only two characters named in this entire book, the Lord and Jonah. This is a book about their relationship. Everything else that happens, everything else that's introduced into this story, everyone who speaks in this story, all of it it has to do to help us understand what is going on between the Lord and Jonah. Jonah is a prophet. His job is to bring God's people into alignment with God's word by telling them what the Lord has said. Uh, We often think of prophets as those who tell the future. We always think of the future-telling portion of what prophets do, but that's actually a smaller portion. There is some of that, but it's a smaller portion of what they do. Mostly, the prophets brought God's conviction and direction based on what the people should have already known because they have God's law. And that means that Jonah, in his position as a prophet, is supposed to be very knowledgeable of God's word. And by the way, we're going to see in chapter 2 that he is quite knowledgeable, has some of it memorized even. But more than that, he was supposed to be very faithful. He wasn't just supposed to know the word. He was supposed to be faithful to God's word, and he was supposed to help other people become faithful to God's word. So when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, what's supposed to happen is unhesitating, unwavering obedience. Arise, go to Nineveh, cry out against them. These are three commands that are well within the job description of a prophet. And and a person who loves the Lord and loves his word, you would think would be very excited to receive a word from the Lord, don't you think? But this prophet does the exact opposite of faithfulness. In fact, on the globe, he actually goes in the opposite direction. Nineveh is east of where he is, sort of a northeast of where he is. He goes west. And what he's trying to do here in this escape is even worse than just mere disobedience. Two times in the first two verses, it says that Jonah was trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. Now, we don't know why, at this point, he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. That answer is going to come in a few weeks. But here we can see that the problem isn't just the Ninevites. The problem Jonah has is with the Lord himself. Jonah is trying to escape having to be seen, known, and guided by the Lord. And so I think it's worth asking the question at this point. 
Is Jonah stupid? It's not an automatic no, actually. This guy knows full well that Tarshish is also on the earth created by God. He knows that. He's well aware of the scriptures. It's in the southern part of Spain at the farthest point west known at that time to Israel. So to Jonah, this would have been the end of the earth in the opposite direction. But how could Jonah think that by going there, he would escape the presence of the Lord as if God somehow couldn't reach him in Tarshish? I thought a lot about this. And here's what I think. Here's what I think is going on. I think Jonah thought that if he was too far from Nineveh, God would have to come up with a different plan. If he's far enough away from Nineveh, God's going to see, I'm going to need a different plan here. God would stop working with him. God would change his will if he saw just how far away and impossible this would. God would no stop noticing or caring about Jonah, and the new plan wouldn't require Jonah then to be part of it. So the run for Tarshish was an attempt to make it so logistically unfeasible for Jonah to be faithful that he would, in a sense, escape his responsibility to be faithful to the Lord. And when I think of it that way, when I consider the distance, the literal physical distance, and the logistical nightmare it would be for him to be the one sent to Nineveh based on where he is, it makes me wonder, church, what we have done in response to Jesus' command to go and make disciples. I wonder how many in the church today have created a scenario where they feel very confident excusing themselves from the mission because their lives that they have built are simply too far away from what it would take to be faithful to God in what he has called us to do. Boy, Kyle, you know, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm in a, I'm in a really busy season in my life right now. Yeah, we all are. Have you ever met someone who was not in a busy season of life? I haven't. Every person I talk to is in a busy season of life. Maybe COVID quarantine. We could have been, I guess, busier then, right? But everybody's got their things going on. Everybody's got their stuff. You don't have to be physically, you don't have to physically move a quarter of the globe away around the world to try to escape from the presence of the Lord. You can concoct any number of excuses for why you don't have to be faithful to God's command and try to slip out of the presence of the Lord. And as strange as it sounds, everything that happens after verse 3 here, everything that happens in the book is actually God's grace to Jonah. It's God's grace to an excuse-making, disobedient, sinful man. Pick it up in verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Do you see Jonah's direction here? His direction? He arises to flee. But then he goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the ship. And then he goes down into the inner part of the ship to lay down to sleep. He's going to go down one more level at the end of this chapter. Okay? Apart from this being great Hebrew writing, which it is, this sh is showing us the physical and mental distance that Jonah is trying to put between himself and the Lord. My, uh, my aunt tells this great story about my dad when he was a little boy. They, they were about a year apart. He was a little boy. She was a little girl. And they were growing up on the farm. And uh, I love this story. My dad used to tell this story, and I, my aunt tells it as well. But they had a train track that ran through the back of their farm. 
And uh, my dad, every time the train would come and my dad would get a little bit scared inside, he would run over and physically put his head into a hole in the ground and yell, come on, you old choo-choo, you can't get me. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? My aunt says that as a little girl, she thought it worked because the choo-choo did not, in fact, get him. Jonah is a grown man trying to do the same thing. Come on, you old God, you can't get me. He's going to close his eyes, and and he's going to sleep out the journey. He's going to wake up refreshed. He's going to start learning Spanish, right? Just kidding. They weren't speaking Spanish yet. Jonah is closing his eyes, and he's attempting to escape the reality of the Lord. I'm I'm going to get away so that I can create my own kind of comfortable little world here in the bottom of this ship, and I'm going to put away from my mind the reality of God and what he's doing to the ship. But you know who's not escaping the reality of the Lord? The pagan sailors up on deck. Those guys are right in the brunt of the reality of the Lord. The Lord hurls a storm onto the Mediterranean Sea, and it's so bad that even these experienced sailors are in genuine fear, and they they start crying out to their their pagan false gods. Now, don't read that with judgment. Oh, I can't believe they called out to these pagan gods. No, guess what? They are doing exactly the right thing at exactly the right time. They just don't know exactly the right God to cry out to. There's one on board who does. There's one who knows the God who created this storm. But he's so unfaithful that even though these men are going to die without the Lord, he doesn't care. These guys are throwing precious cargo into the sea in order to save their own lives. That'd be like if you took everything you own this afternoon, brought it out into the yard, and set it on fire. This cargo is what they were going to sell. This is their livelihood. They're doing anything they can to save themselves. And so the captain goes down to Jonah and says, what do you mean, you sleeper? Which is a little bit awkward grammatically. If I could translate that, I would say, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? How could you be sleeping down here? Arise. Call out to your God. Remember the last time Jonah heard the word arise? It was back up there in verse 2, and it was the Lord telling him to arise. Now pagan sailors are asking him to do what the Lord told him to do. It's like the Lord just said, found you. I got you with pagan sailors on this boat. Even they know to cry out to God. So what it's time for, Jonah, is to get up there on that ship deck and repent and turn. Because even... My words are now on the lips of these men. So Jonah goes back up onto deck, the deck, but notice there's no mention of him crying out to the Lord. The storm's still raging, and so they cast lots to determine the culprit, basically rolling dice to figure out who it is. This is their way of trying to make a determination. And God, being sovereign over everything, including the lots, indicates that it's Jonah. Pick it up with me in verse 8. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea had grown more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah now knows that there is no hiding from the presence of the Lord. But notice his tactic changes here just slightly. 
The sailors ask him a bunch of questions to determine his place of origin and, and, and who his God is because they need to identify the God that they need to pray to to make this storm stop. And so he tells them that he's a Hebrew and that he fears the Lord. He tells them that this Lord that he fears is the universal God. He's not just some local deity. He's the God of over everything. He's the God who made the very sea that is about to take the lives of all of them. And then he tells them that he's running from the presence of the Lord. And so the reaction, obviously, is, well, why? What have you done? Why have you brought this on us? Now, to this point, we might be inclined to think that Jonah is about to turn it around right here. Like, this would be the moment where he's going to say, okay, i got to change my heart. I have known plenty of people in my life who have become very contrite and confess what they did once they're caught. Once they're caught. But it's a much smaller number of those folks who then repent and turn from their sin and go and sin no more, like Jesus said. Jonah confesses, but he doesn't make the turn in his heart. He confesses what is going on. He doesn't make the turn back to the Lord. Instead, what he appears to do is attempt one final escape from the Lord's presence. The sailors ask what they need to do to Jonah for the, for the storm to quiet down, and Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Now, it's subtle, but that is an evil request. Let me give you two other things Jonah could have said. He could have said, turn the boat around and head for shore because I have to do what God tells me to do. He could have said that. Now, I'm speculating a bit here now, but if disobedience caused this storm, which clearly it did, obedience would have turned the storm off, right? Right? They could have at least tried that. Here's another thing he could have said. Stand back, fellas, I'm jumping into the sea. Right? That's a terrible choice. But at least it wouldn't have involved the sailors in that case. But instead of faithfulness, or at least taking responsibility for his own death, Jonah opts for murder. Because Jonah doesn't care about these guys at all. He doesn't care about them. Jonah reasons, if I'm going to die, I'm going to take these pagans down with me one way or the other. I'm getting that, by the way, both from the response of the sailors in verse 13 we're about to read here, and from the rest of the book where we see Jonah's heart on full display. Jonah doesn't care about these sailors. Jonah, in this moment, isn't trying to save these sailors. He's making them part of his final escape from the Lord. But the sailors... Well, they're not having it. Verse 13, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The men were not going to throw this guy in. They weren't going to do it. They rode hard to get back to dry land. Now, that might seem like a solution that would stop the storm, but you have to remember this is a story not about storms, but about the relationship between the Lord and Jonah, and that had not been fixed yet. Jonah is un, an unrepentant, stubborn little man in the back of the boat with his arms folded while increasingly noble and righteous sailors are now trying to save Jonah's life. Who's supposed to be saving who here? Who's supposed to be the righteous one here? These guys do everything that they can to get that boat back to shore, and they just can't do it because the Lord won't allow it. And so pagan sailors who just learned the Lord's name when they asked Jonah a moment ago now go to prayer to him in his name. Lord, don't make us die for this man's life. 
meaning we didn't do what he did. Lay not on us innocent blood. Don't hold us accountable for what we do next because it's the only option available to us. You, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. Did these pagan sailors just learn about the sovereignty of the Lord on this boat? I think they did. And then they pick him up and they hurl him into the sea and the storm quits. And then we have the final scene of this chapter and it captures the irony of the whole story thus far, doesn't it? On deck you've got idol-worshipping non-Hebrews worshipping the Lord exceedingly. And below the boat, the one guy who should have been worshiping the Lord the whole time is sinking to his death. But his death saved the sailors. And now they're worshiping the Lord. So let me ask you, was Jonah a good missionary? I don't know about you. I've never saved a whole boat full of sailors before. I don't know. The point is, God is going to do precisely what he plans to do. As we examine our hearts to see if we're prepared for Christ's mission to make disciples, church, let me close with three diagnostic facts that come from the first chapter of this cautionary tale. First of all, there is nowhere outside the presence of the Lord. Nowhere. No amount of excuse making or wishing it away will allow us to escape the presence of the Lord and his call on our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once wrote, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. He gets that, Bonhoeffer got that from Jesus who said, if you want to save your life, you're going to have to lose it for my sake and the gospel. Mark chapter 8. In light of Jonah's foolishness, if, if you find yourself wanting to claim faith in Christ, but for some reason not at all engage in the mission to make disciples, you need to look honestly and deeply at your own, own heart and ask the question, why? Why do I feel that way? You've been called. You've been called because you follow Jesus. You've been called to the mission. Why are you running from it? The second diagnostic fact is this. God will accomplish exactly what he sets out to do, either by your faithfulness or your foolishness. It's a, it's a great comfort to know that no amount of human error is going to trip God up, isn't it? Isn't that a great, that's a great comfort to me, to know that no matter what happens, no matter how much foolishness, no matter how much disobedience there is in the world, that God is going to accomplish exactly what he's going to do. It's a if, if you're not going to do it, the rocks are going to cry out. The wind and the waves. You don't want to obey him, they're going to obey him. But if in your heart, you comfort yourself with the thought that you can, be, that you can safely ignore Christ's call to his mission for the church because it will get done some other way, if that's the way you're reasoning based on your view of what God does in the world, I am deeply concerned for your soul. God can work through your foolishness, but what about you? What about you? What about your soul? What about your eternity? What about your salvation? There's nothing in the rest of this book. A little spoiler alert here, but there is nothing, nothing in the rest of this book that suggests that Jonah was a man who truly loved and obeyed the Lord, that he submitted to God that he ever embraced the mission. Don't let God's sovereign wrangling of Jonah's life here comfort you to think that you can ignore the call and be fine eternally. There's no promise of that in this book. Which leads to the final diagnostic truth to evaluate your own heart. Faithfulness to God's mission, no matter the cost, is the only right and good response. What is in that heart of yours when it comes to the thought of the gospel spreading? When, you, when, it comes, when you think about the gospel spread and the sacrifice that will be required, what is the thought that you have when you think about the gospel spreading throughout our community where God has sent us here in Rochester? I hope it's joy. 
I hope you have joy springing up in your heart when you think about us reaching out to those who need Jesus in this community. I hope the thought is, sign me up, Lord. Where do you have us going next? I want you to begin to cultivate in your heart a willingness to transform a lot of what we do here at Calvary. I want you to start to cultivate that willingness to see change coming, to repurpose our resources, to change our programs, and to personally sacrifice both comfort and tradition to take the gospel to our neighbors here in Rochester and to the places in the world where Christ is not yet named. Let's be active. Let's be active, joyous participants in Christ's mission, which will confirm in our hearts that we have life in Christ. We don't want to escape his presence If you do, I want to talk to you. Because if you love Jesus and you love his mission, you don't want to escape his presence. You don't want to default on his mission. We want to be on the front lines of all that God is accomplishing.